All right, welcome back everybody. So today I thought we could go over some of those clustering metrics that I was talking about in the spatial transcriptomics video. Um, the one that we had used was the nearest neighbor G, um, but there are a couple other ones here. Um, if we go to the spatial time package uh, page, the GitHub IO, uh, we can see that we have a couple vignettes here. So there's that introduction and then the deriving functions. The deriving functions don't have any explanation about what the value means, um, but it kind of shows you how the functions work. Um, and I actually just ran into an error for the bivariate pair correlation. It doesn't work on my Windows computer, but it worked on my Mac for some reason. All right. Uh, so this is the vignette. If we want to look at all the different functions, we can go here to the reference page. Um, can also go to the GitHub page itself. If there's issues, you can leave an issue. This is all non-critical things, some things that we want to, to do. Um, go back. But if we jump into our studio, uh, we can see here I have the first four functions, um, the univariate and bivariate for both the Ripley's K and the nearest neighbor G and I have them uh, plotted here as they show in the vignette. Um, I did up the number of permutations just because this is, this is super fast. Uh, we're only doing two markers versus a bunch of the other ones. Um, so let's go back to here. Uh, yeah, that's what I want. So Ripley's K is a count measure, which means that we have an anchor. So if we take all of our CD3 cells, uh, CD3, CD8 cells, and we just plot those on an XY plot. What we do is we go from each positive cell out the radius that we want to measure. So say we want to measure here a radius of 50. We'll go out 50 units, and here it's pixels. And then we'll count the number of positive cells that fall within that radius. Um, so we have our anchor. If there's five cells out besides that anchor that are within that radius, um, then we'll count five and we'll do that for all of our cells. And at the end of it, we normalize it to the number of positive cells that we have in our sample as well as the area. And that's called the lambda or the intensity of our point pattern. Um, for the bivariate, it's similar. We have our CD3 and, and so we have our CD8 and our FOXP3 cells subset out from our point plot that we had, like if we looked at the spatial transcriptomic data. And then we go to each one of those CD8 positive spots, and then we measure out around it whatever radius we want to look, and we're gonna count the actual or we're gonna count the FOXP3 positive cells. So that's the bivariate way. And it's the same for um, this this Ripley's K as well as the nearest neighbor G. So that's the count, and then again, it's normalized. And in this case, it's a little bit more confusing because there's two different cell types. Um, the intensity is a little bit different between the two of them. Um, so it's, it's a combination of the, the two intensity that's normalized against. But the uh, moral of the story, it's, it's normalized, so Ripley's K kind of means the same thing between samples. Um, nearest neighbor G, uh, this here is using an edge correction, so it'll actually decrease based on how close that cell is to the edge of the sample. Um, but in a perfect world where we don't need edge correction, you could always use edge correction, uh, it's a cumulative distribution function. So what does a cumulative distribution function mean? That means as the sample, as your radius increases to the point where all cells in your sample are within that radius, everything, um, the y-axis will become one, and that's as high as it's gonna go. So how we would interpret, um, let me see, you gotta go to this guy, how we would interpret the nearest neighbor G metric is that if we look at the observed G here and the radius at which, um, the, the value comes up to that proportion. We can say here, maybe at a radius of 15, 50% uh, of all CD8 positive cells in this sample have another CD8 positive cell within 15 pixels of it. 
um, in, in any direction. We can see here this pink one is is increasing. Uh, the green one here kind of drops off again. I'm guessing this is because of the edge correction that I was talking about. Um, Fox P3 is kind of the same story. If we look here at this pink one, we can say 25% of um, cells in this sample, uh, what is that one? PMA3 9K. 25% um, of cells have a, another FOXP3 cell within a radius of 45, for example. The hard part, and this is kind of why I wanted to make this video, because when we were talking about it in the spatial transcriptomics video, I didn't really get a chance to explain it. The actual values that we're looking at, and whenever using these kinds of metrics, you want to use the degree of clustering permutation, and I'll kind of talk a little bit about that. But this value is the observed value, so that's going to be this here down on the on the right hand corner, minus what is calculated to be completely random for the same number of positive cells. So if green had 25 CD8 positive cells, completely random for any combination of 25 positive cells on that sample. Uh, so that's what's being subtracted out, and we call that complete spatial randomness. And we measure that with this permutation flag. So we run permutations in this green sample for if there are 25 positive cells. Um, we randomly assign out of all the cells in that sample 25 positive ones 500 times and calculate this nearest neighbor G metric. Then we're subtracting that from our observed value. And what this tells us is that if our value is positive in this degree of clustering plot, that means we're observing greater clustering than we would expect if the CD8 positive cells were just randomly placed in our sample. And that can be helpful when looking for things like biomarkers. Um, conversely, if we see a negative value, like we do here for the TMA2 of CD8 positive, what we're actually interpreting this as is that we're observing less clustering of CD8 positive cells up until a radius of 90 or 87, something like that. Um, our observed value is actually less than what we would expect if the CD8 positive cells were just randomly placed on, on the sample, which usually means that they're uniformly distributed uh, across our sample. So they're not random they're actually being repulsed. There's a repulsion happening in our CD8 positive cells, which is very interesting. Um, and the interpretation is a little, it, the interpretation is the same, but the meaning is different uh, for our univariate um, K and then our univariate G. Uh, so you can see here, uh, this is K, uh, the value is much higher. Um, and it's kind of an arbitrary value. It's really hard to interpret the raw value, whereas um, the univariate G, we're able to interpret the, ob the observed. Um, it's, it's a little bit more complicated trying to interpret the degree of clustering, the observed minus that permuted complete spatial randomness measure for each sample. So why do we want to use the degree of clustering permutation um, when comparing between samples? Because what that's doing is it's actually removing the estimate of randomly placed cells in our sample from our observed value. If we're just looking at our observed value, we might be seeing something that looks clustered, when in reality, we're actually observing something that is more based on the tissue architecture. So if there's a giant hole, we might be seeing more clustering just because there's a hole where no cells are able to be. So we have to measure where cells are in the sample by permuting um, what is actually the random value. If we look at these metrics when they come out, um, they do have, oh, uh, didn't copy. They do have a theoretical measurement. And the theoretical measurement for Ripley's K is just pi r squared, so everything is normalized to the area of the circle. Um, where nearest neighbor G is a little bit more difficult because it 
depends on the intensity or the number of positive cells that there actually are for uh, the marker that you're looking for. So CD8 is going to have a different theoretical measurement, uh, a th different theoretical value than box P3 will have, just because there's a different number of positive cells. Ripley's K, it doesn't matter the number of positive cells. Um, everything will have the same theoretical value at the same radius. Um, so the theoretical is something that can be used, but it's much less reliable uh, because of issues with tissue, more or less. In samples where the tissue doesn't have any holes and it's pretty uniform across the entire thing for positive cells, um, the theoretical and the permuted will be very similar. Um, Ripley's K will be the same. Uh, univariate count. So we have our theoretical. Um, so let's actually do this. So yeah, so we can see that our theoretical for uh, CD8 and FOXP3 are going to be the same. Um, yeah. So another thing that I can talk about here quick is if we look at uh, bivariate, well, let's look at univariate K. This will just be quick. For, un for, for Ripley's K, univariate or bivariate, it doesn't matter, um, there is the ability to not permute. We're able to measure exactly what that CSR, complete spatial randomness measure is. Um, so if you have a lot of samples, and you don't want to run permutations because it can take a really long time, you can run this exact measure and instead of averaging over a bunch of permutations, this will be the true average if you ran every combination of cells that are positive um, in your sample, this will be the average of every combination, which is really cool. It saves a lot of time. Uh, whereas with the permutations, the higher you go, you'll start honing in on that true average. Um, but sometimes if there's a lot of issues with the architecture of the sample, it can take a lot of permutations. For some of the ones that we've done, we had to run thousands of permutations, 8,000 permutations, um, just to be more confident that the average that we're taking is, is real. Uh, so yeah, that's just kind of one of, kind of what I wanted to do and throw out just to make sure that when we're looking at the clustering of these cells, um, we're able to interpret it in a meaningful way. And I like the univariate G because it's something that I think it's closer to one. That just means you're, you're closer to encompassing all of your cells uh, unless you have an edge correction applied. But it's much easier to interpret a bound value like this than Ripley's K where it can get astronomically high. Um, but yeah, if you have questions, let me know. Uh, I'll be happy to answer them since this is the, the package that I had written or I'm now the maintainer of. Um, I was not the main guy, but so this is the updated version and this should actually be two. So if we go back over here in the description file, two, um, it's just not updated on this. Um, so this is the most updated version and it's much faster than the original. So if there's questions, Feel free to let me know. Thanks, guys.